Uh, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to give a special welcome to any first-time guests. If you're with us, we are grateful to have you and just pray that you'll be encouraged as we worship together. Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8 this morning. Uh, currently, we're doing a Sunday school for newcomers. Uh, it's going to end in a three-week series on church membership. And I think one of the great harms that has happened in the last 30 years in the church is that we lost God's great design of the church and what it means to be a part of it and to give yourself to the bride of Christ. And we desire to recover that for the glory of God and the blessing that comes from the design that God has in this word to fulfill the great commission together. So I encourage you to join that class uh, if you are new. Uh, yesterday, we had our evangelism kind of seminar together, and it was just a joy to have so many of you come, and it just we're, we're our koinonia of trying to learn this gospel and how to share it and how to be effective and understand it, and so uh, just grateful uh, for our time together yesterday. This morning, we're going to continue worshiping by the proclaimed Word of God. What a gift that God has given to His church, the infallible Word of God, and now we're going to open up God's Word, inspired Word, and seek Him for the understanding of it and worship Him for what is before us this morning. So we find ourselves in Romans 8, uh, verses 26 through 27. Let me read it, and then we will, we will open it up. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these words. I pray now we, we need your Spirit to teach us them. We want to understand these in a way that we, we, we get the mind of God, what you're teaching us, and it gets into our hearts and shows the beauty of how we will make it to the end. You've given us everything for life and godliness. And I thank you that you even have given us your Holy Spirit, God. So teach us this morning. Let us get this. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've been looking, if you'll uh, open up Romans 8, we've been looking at Romans 8, verses 17 through 25, back to verse 17. <clears throat> if we're children... We're going to be heirs also. We're going to inherit what children inherit. Uh, and that's going to be heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We're going to inherit God. We're going to be joint heirs with Christ, those who are children. And then this little clause, if indeed we suffer with him so that we might be glorified with him. And so we're going to, we're going to, we're being joined to Christ. We get all his benefits, all that he's done to secure our salvation. And he's going to bring us to glory. We're joint heirs with him, but we're going to be joint sufferers with Christ on the way to glory. That's what we've been looking at. Paul is flushing that great truth out now in detail in verses 18 through 25 uh, and now 26 through 27. And, and I've entitled it the groaning section. And verses 18 through 22, creation is groaning. It wants to be set free from the futility that it was subjected to when Adam and Eve sinned. It, it wants to be set free from its uh, decay and its corruption. And then we saw in verses 23 through 25, believers are groaning. We have sin still in our bodies and weakness and decay and, and struggles and mental battles and all the things that we go through. We're groaning, saying, I want the redemption of this body. Set me free. Creation wants to be set free. I want to be set free unto this glorious inheritance that God has laid up for us in Christ. Now, this morning, we see that the Holy Spirit groans, and he groans to strengthen our hope even more and the certainty of this gospel. And so this chapter teaches more on the Holy Spirit than any chapter, I think, in the Bible. It's been rich and it's been helpful. And so I just want to review as we begin to look at the Holy Spirit this morning just from Romans. First, in Romans 5.5, 5, Paul told us the love of God has been shed abroad. It's been poured out within our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
And so the Holy Spirit, uh, he says, God demonstrates his love to us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Holy Spirit sheds that into our hearts. I'm loved by God. And he, he speaks it, he tells us it and proclaims that I have been loved by this God and what he did on Calvary's tree. <clears throat> then we saw in Romans 7, 6, that we've been released from the law, trying to keep it and perform to get God's favor and approval. He says, having died to that by which you were bound, law, so that now, new covenant, we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so I've been set free and I serve in a whole new way by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then in Romans 8, 2, we are told the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the Holy Spirit has brought us out from the sin of Adam and the death that would come, and now we have life in the Spirit. Romans 8, 4, now the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us believers who do not walk according to the flesh but the Spirit. And so we can finally now fulfill the law to love God and love others but as we walk in the Spirit. And so this whole new covenant sets you free to love like no other a supernatural love that comes from God. Romans 8, 6, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And now as we're led by the spirit, it brings life to us and peace. Thank you, Father. Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him, Jesus, of the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, believer, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so this Holy Spirit is going to take these dead corpses one day and just raise them to eternal life in the promise we've been studying. Romans 8, 13, the Holy Spirit causes us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. So as believers, we still have remaining sin. And he gave us a spirit who is fighting put to death the, the deeds of the body in each one of us. There is a, a battle raging within us, the Spirit of God putting to death the remaining sin. And we had a long study to look at how he does that. In verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit are those who are putting to death the deeds of the body. And so the Spirit will be leading us in to fighting and putting to death sin, starving its lifeline. And then in verses 15 through 16, the Spirit um, speaks Abba. Instead of fear and condemnation, now under grace, the Spirit speaks, I can, instead of fleeing from God, I can cry Abba. I can cry to Him with this new relationship of adoption and look to Him as my Abba. And then the Spirit, He says, bears witness with ours that we're indeed children of God. The Spirit testifies, I'm a child of God. And now this morning, we're going to finish out Paul's look at the Holy Spirit, and he, he intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit of God prays for us, and I want to understand what that means and get our arms around it this morning. But my conclusion is without the Holy Spirit, we would be lifeless, we would be helpless, and we would be hopeless. And so it was good uh, that Jesus went away and sent his Spirit into the world to manifest Christ to our hearts. So let's take this up. Our immediate context is we are groaning for the redemption of our bodies. We, we want to be set free from these bodies. We're, we're looking to glory. We're looking to the finish line where Christ is at. And I believe from this text that even the Holy Spirit of God longs for our final redemption. I, I want final redemption, and the Holy Spirit wants it. He wants to, the consummation of all things in Ephesians, the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ is where history is going to end. So what's the role of the Holy Spirit? To be a floodlight on Christ. So he's longing for that day when he's just put on display and everybody worships and declares Jesus is all. And so the Holy Spirit is he's longing for that consummation and, and the closing up of history. And so he is housed inside of these unredeemed bodies. And though we have a redeemed spirit, the first fruits, he is at work conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. He will bring us to glory. He who began a good work in us will complete it. So the Holy Spirit longs for God's ultimate day of restoration and the eternal reign of righteousness. And he wills to make sure that every believer in Christ, every blood-bought child makes it to glory. He's, he's in as much as the Father and the Son are. 
For the bride that will be made perfect and spotless and holy, that will be made up from every tribe, tongue, and nation. I was so blessed in our class this morning with the newcomers. It's just We come from all walks of life, and I just smile at every tribe, tongue, and nation and what God is doing in our midst. And they're going to be presented to the Son as a bride, and He groans for our final redemption. And all that is necessary for us to get to that place He is for you, and he's working for your good as well as the Father and the Son. So if you'll look with me, we'll take up this morning then in verse 26. In the same way, in the same way that that this hope sustains us in suffering, uh, the Spirit as well, he comes to our aid in our weakness and in our infirmities. Remember, we looked last week that the world's been subjected to futility, and it's coming undone, and we're coming undone. You'll never get Fantasy Island here on this earth. And so we have weaknesses. We have infirmities and difficulties. We're groaning in creation with these bodies, and the Spirit is there to help us, to hope and glory, to, to get us to our hope to be made complete. He helps us journey in this fallen, subjected, futile world. It's difficult. It's hard. God gives the Holy Spirit to help us, children of God. It's so hard. It's difficult in the journey. Get behind me, Satan. (laughs) It's hard. I heard a testimony Friday night in my community group of some of the deepest suffering and battle with, with mental battles and stuff. It Overwhelmed my heart how hard the journey had been. Then I heard on Saturday morning just a lady who lost her son. We looked at the gospel we were sharing. And then I got to sit with Sammy and Ray yesterday and all that she'd been through with the chemo and how deep and hard it got. It just, it's just a hard journey to glory. And the Holy Spirit in the same way wants us to hope. He wants us to hope in the midst of all the suffering and pain that we're facing on our way, that we would suffer with Christ, that we might get his inheritance. Anyone worn out and weary from this futility and suffering? Anyone ever feel like giving up, like your fingers are sliding off the promises, that you don't know how to continue? You don't, you don't even know how to pray anymore. I need help, but I don't even know what to ask for. What would please God in in this situation? What what do I do? Anyone afraid that the futility and suffering are going to get the best of you and you won't make it to glory? This is only for the strong saints who have it all together, right? To smile and rejoice in your suffering, offer up prayers that sound like the tongues of angels, right? I have a word for you this morning. I have a hope increaser this morning. Is that a word, increaser? I, I like it. I want to increase your hope this morning with miracle grow all over your little fledgling hope. If it feels dim and flickering, it's just gotten so hard. I want you to lift your eyes up this morning to this promise. It's just gasoline for your hope. I want to pray again. Father, please increase hope. Let our eyes get off our circumstances and the futility of this world, God, and let us look again to the finish line that we are guaranteed to make it to, the new heavens and the new earth where Jesus is. God, please fill your your people with hope. This morning by the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. In the same way, I could meditate on that phrase for a long time. I want you to spend some time with God this week, just in the same way. And here's your outline for these two verses. Paul's going to give us three considerations how the Spirit helps us to glory. The fact of the Spirit's help we'll look at. And then the nature, how does he help us? And then I want to look at the effect of the Spirit's help. It's, it's, it's efficacy. So let's look first at the fact of the Spirit's help in verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. In John 14, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to go away and it's to your advantage because I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to send a parakletos, the the paraclete, the one called alongside to help. And so we have a helper who comes alongside from the inside. He dwells within us and he's been given and he helps our weakness. So the weakness here is interesting. It's in the singular. 
And so it's more of a general state of weakness. It means a lack of strength, infirmity. It's uh, rather, the, it's more dealing with the consequences of the fall of man. We live in our frailty as human beings. And so there's, there's much weakness as human beings. We saw that last week. And one of the fruits of our weakness is that we have ignorance. We have a lack of understanding, uh, making right decisions in the midst of this futility. Even as Christians, we see in a mirror dimly. We groan in these weaknesses to be birthed into perfect humanity on a perfect earth with a perfect Godhead. We're groaning. And so we're dull, though, in so much of what we do. In our circumstances, sometimes we're just perplexed. I don't know how to think about it. We don't know what to do, where to go, how to do it. We're just subject to weakness. We have a great handicap. And the Spirit helps us. And he says he helps us for we don't know how to pray as we should. The ESV, I think, handles this translation well. It says we do not know what to pray. <clears throat> I don't think it's so much the manner and how you pray, but the matter, the content of your prayers, what, what I'm to pray for. I need help. So right away, Paul's helping us understand what he's talking about because much of Scripture tells us what to pray for, to, to grow, to share, to have faith that the kingdom comes, the authority is over us to pray for. So there's a lot in the Scriptures that tell us we do know how to pray. So these are times when we don't have clear scriptures and we don't have clear thinking and I, I don't know how to pray about this battle in the feudal world that I'm facing. It's decaying. I don't know how to pray in this circumstance right now. My, my depression and I, I can't think right. I don't even know what to say. Many times I'm just perplexed and I don't know. I don't know what to ask of God. What is his will for this? I don't know. And our human limitations, we, do, we just can't pray rightly. What's necessary in this case? I'm stumped. If God answered yes to all of my prayers, I would have shipwrecked myself so long ago. Watching others groan and myself and praying the wrong thing for relief sometimes and not hope. And so I need help and you need help. I just don't know how to pray as I sure should. The heart of this in verse 27, he says, the will of God. And so there's times I don't know the will of God. And that's why we pray, Lord, if it be your will. And I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling to know in this situation. And so what I want you to catch is Paul says this. He says he helps what? Our weakness. Paul puts himself in this category. This difficulty in praying isn't just for new immature believers. This is the Apostle Paul. This is all believers. There's just times we don't know. I think even mature believers battle this more. They're growing and they're understanding more of God's mysterious ways and how he works. You have a lifetime of saying, I didn't get that. I wouldn't have done it that way. Look what God did. And we see how he works many times not according to human wisdom or knowledge. And we're all included in this weakness, not knowing how to pray as we ought. John Knox says our needs go far beyond the power of our speech to express them. Um, I'm just going to, I got a bunch of examples. Which one do I want to go with? I'm going to go with Moses. Deuteronomy 3.23. He said, I also pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, O Lord God, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such things and mighty acts as thine? Let me, I pray, God, cross over and see the fair land that is beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and Lebanon. I want to go into the promised land. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough, speak no more on this matter. Uh, Moses can't get it, the will of God. I'm, I'm praying it. Remember Paul, he's saying, uh, get this, take this uh, uh, thorn out of my flesh. He says, I prayed it three times, and, and, and God says, I got something better. My grace is sufficient. And I want to look at that this morning. It's difficult because of our weakness to know what to pray, especially in these verses of suffering that we're looking at this morning. So no, so what do we do when we're in the midst of difficulties and you don't know what to pray? Are we just hung out to dry? God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness, 
We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So here they are. But in regards to this need we have, we have been given a perfect solution. More perfect than I could have ever imagined. I think a solution that rests too lightly on the church of God today. And so look at the answer. The Spirit also helps our weakness. We're weakness, but the Spirit is omnipotent. This is the best cure I could ever think of for weakness. It's better than spinach. It's Holy Spirit. Look at this word here. This word for helps. It's a beautiful word. Soon ante lambanatai. Isn't that beautiful? It's big and long, and it's translated helps. Like It's got to be more than that. It's made up of three words. Soon, ante, and lambano. And if you bring them together, the definition is a person coming alongside another to take a part of a heavy load and help them bear it. The Holy Spirit's going to come and take that other side of the log and he's going to help you bury it. Maybe like Simon who helped Jesus carry that cross. Anyone here this morning have a heavy load because this world has been subjected to futility? Jesus called the Holy Spirit the parakletos. He's going to come alongside. He's going to be a comforter. He is going to help us. And so the Holy Spirit comes alongside our weakness, and he helps by bearing this burden for us. And it pictures our ignorance. I don't even know how to pray with this heavy load. I'm just struggling under it. And the Holy Spirit comes and shoulders the load. Think of Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you, for it's easy, it's light. So the picture of oxen yoked together, here's this offer, come be yoked to Jesus Christ. And and his load that that was heavy is now going to become light. And so here's these heavy weights that we're facing, and the Holy Spirit comes and helps and bears them to make them light. The Holy Spirit makes the burden light with our groaning under the weight and confusion of, of the futility of this world. So let's look at how he does it, the second point. I want to look then, that's what he does. He helps our weakness, but the nature, how does he do it? And if you'll look with me, it says, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Simple enough. Thomas, you want to close in a song? Let's go home. I hope that that caused you the same battle it caused me all week to understand that. Simple. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. Here's the tricky part. 2,000 years of debate on this verse. Anything amazing and beautiful, the devil will always attack with endless debate. And so I want to work through this this morning. The Spirit intercedes, to intercede for another, to plead on one's behalf. Uh, The intercessor, he pleads on your case. And so this is the way the Holy Spirit helps shoulder my burden, by pleading our case with God when we don't know how to do it. We don't know what to pray, and we don't know what to say he does. We, we, we have the Holy Spirit who knows God's will. He knows the mind of God. Nate uh, read it this morning. He, we have the mind of Christ. The Spirit knows God's thoughts. He is God. 1 Corinthians 2.11, who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. He knows the mind of God. And in our weakness and ignorance, we have one who dwells within us who intercedes for us, who knows the perfect will of God. He helps us shoulder this load of ignorance and burden and weight under this futility for the will of God to help us. I think of our intercessor who prayed for Peter. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, I've interceded for you, that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers, Peter. And notice Peter didn't know how to pray, did he? He didn't know that Satan came and asked permission to take him out. Christ, the intercessor, did, and he prayed, and and we know it was the will of God. And what happened? Peter's faith did not fail, and he turned again, and he strengthened the brethren and became the great leader in the church of God. And now I want you to hear this in Romans 8, 34. The Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, from glory, is interceding on your behalf. He intercedes in heaven for me that my faith won't fail. 
And the Holy Spirit of God intercedes in my heart. And he prays for me because of my weakness. I'm encapsulated in intercession. Sometimes I have someone say, nobody prays for me. Yeah, they do. Jesus prays for you in the Holy Spirit. I'll take that over any one of you. And you just got heaven. You got your heart. And, and next time we're together, you got God who causes all things to work together for good. You are encapsulated. If God were to just justify me, you're saved. And leave me to myself, I would go right to hell. But we've been saved, and we're being saved, and we will be saved. And we're going to look in verses 29 through 30 that God predestined us, and he's going to bring us to glory. It will happen. Godhead is what secures that. All three are engaged for my good in the rest of this chapter. This is like the the grand finale on the 4th of July. Just We're closing out this chapter and just boom, boom, boom. The Father's for you. The Son is for you. The Holy Spirit's for you. You will make it to glory. It's not up to your power, your strength. Be encouraged this morning. The whole Trinity is working for your good. Thank you. (laughs) Gets me fired up. How does he intercede for us? That's the tricky part. He does it with groanings too deep for words. Are these groanings ours or the groanings of the Holy Spirit? And that's where I, there's a lot of debate. From my perspective, <clears throat> all the arguments that I read that it's us groaning, none of them seem to be textual but experiential. And there are times when we groan and our groanings are coming before God in this futility. Spurgeon said the best prayer I ever heard was, ugh. I'm like, Amen. But I believe this text is clearly teaching the groanings are the Holy Spirit. Because the groan occurs three times in this section, and it seems to be a deliberate progression. Creation's groaning, we're groaning, and the Holy Spirit's groaning. And the little translation is this, but the Spirit himself, it's intensive, the Spirit himself is interceding with unspoken groanings. I I think in a little Greek, you just can't get around it. And then in verse 27, it says, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. It's the Spirit. And in verse 23, Paul already addressed the groaning of the saints. And then he says it's too deep for words. You know what that means? Without words. (laughs) End of story. Okay? So, I see these groans as anthropomorphic. I don't don't know if it's a literal groaning, but there's something that the Spirit's, uh, it's the content of His intercession on our behalf. And just a side note is, this is for free. I don't see a a secret prayer language coming out of here of tongues. The adjective is it's unutterable, so it's it's not noise. And creation did the same thing, and creation is not speaking in tongues. And so it, it, here it is every believer has this, every believer, not just some who have the gift of, of tongues. And so I just want you to just throw that out for free. The groanings are not expressed, they're too deep for words, they're not formulated in intelligible utterance, yet they're far from devoid of content, meaning, or intent, they transcend articulated formulation. And so I think these intercessions are presented to the Father from the Spirit's own groanings. And someone argued, how can the Spirit do it without words? It's got to be us. And my question is, how does Christ do it from heaven? He does it without us, doesn't he? He intercedes without us. How does the Spirit do it? Without us. That's why it's good. (laughs) That's why I'm encouraged. If you add me into it, I mess it up every time. Just keep me out of it. Let the Spirit do it without me. Thank you, Lord. And then what happens in verse 27, then he who comes and searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So who's the one that searches the heart? God the Father. And it says he knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who perfectly knows the will of the Father. He's the one interceding for us when we don't know how to pray as we ought according to the perfect will of God. He does. Catch this. He is the only one who always gets a yes to his prayers. Every time. Because he always prays according to the will of God. 
I, I, I bat like 0.001%. His is 100%. Whatever he prays for is always answered Yes, isn't it nice to have that person dwelling within you, interceding before God? He's always asking the will of God, and it's always done. It's always. So God knows the content and the intent of the intercession, even though it's unutterable. And so catch what I think this verse is saying. As God searches the heart of the children of God, he finds unutterable groanings. Though not articulated in words, there is meaning and intent that cannot escape the omniscient eye of God. They're wholly intelligible to him, and they're found to be in accordance with his will, and they're always answered on our behalf because they're for us every time. And so everything we need to be made perfect in verses 29 through 30 is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. The Spirit's praying for that. He's praying for your conformity to Christ and your growth and getting to glory. He's he's that involved and he's praying according to the will of God for each one of you dwelling within you. My, what a gift. And this crazy futility (coughs) that we have been born into, we have the Spirit interceding on our behalf to give us faith and hope and love that we will be glorified. We can hope this morning in the middle of all this and the Spirit is praying for us and interceding and helping us in our struggles and our hurts and our confusions and our doubts that we keep going and our faith won't fail. And so my encouragement is these unuttered groans show that God does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Even praise for what we don't know how to ask. I can't tell you how safe you are, child of God. So it's not our weakness of understanding the will of God and our request that is the measure of God's grace to us, but the knowledge and wisdom and the love of the Holy Spirit praying for our behalf. And so I can't tell you how eternally secure you are, child of God. You have the Holy Spirit of God interceding for you here on earth, and you have Jesus Christ interceding for you in heaven. Arthur Pink said, instead of turning away from us in disgust because of our ignorance, God has not only provided us with an intercessor at his right hand, but he's also given us a divine intercessor at our right hand, even the Holy Spirit. And just just one last little thing. It's in the present. All these are in the present tense. So we're living in weakness and ignorance. It's just what we are. We're battling that. We live in it. And the Spirit's interceding continually on our behalf. This isn't prayers once a year. (laughs) Thank you, God. It's continual because I I have such need in this fallen, broken world. My last point, I don't know if they're up on the screen or not. 3A. Are they up there? No. No, they are. Perfect. The, The efficacy, the effect of the prayer of the Holy Spirit is how we'll close out, that God always hears the prayers of God. God never says no to God. These prayers of the Spirit are always answered with a yea and amen. The Spirit knows our condition and prays God's will for us, and it's always effectual. In verse 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to to the will of God. Amen. In 1 John 5, we're told if we pray according to God's will, he will hear hear us and grant us our wish. Anytime we pray according to the will of God, you have it. How much more the Holy Spirit of God? How much more the Spirit, when he prays his will, he hears him? And so I just want to close out that you have the Father who we know causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. In Romans 8, 34, it's Christ Jesus, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And in Romans 8, 26 through 27, the Spirit of God is interceding on our behalf. I will make it through this fallen world. I will suffer with Christ, and I'll get the children's reward with him at the end of it by the grace of God. The whole Trinity working together will see to it 
What can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Every prayer so that we will know the love of God in Christ Jesus and hope. And this hope will never disappoint. Thank you, God. So in closing, closing the Spirit helps us hope and, and to get to our hope. And so I just, I, I want us to, to be a people then who are filled with hope. And, and I just want you to see that this fallen feudal world is we've, we've been called out by the Holy Spirit and we've been set apart for God. And I don't have to live like this world trying to get everything in this world. I don't have to hope in the things that they're hoping and the things that they're running after. My hope can set me apart from this world. And so I pray as we're looking at this beautiful hope in the midst of futility, I can live so different because of this hope that I have of what's coming. And so I just want to remind you again of, of the, this hope purifies. And so I pray as the, this, the whole Trinity is working to give us hope, that it's setting us apart from hoping in this world and trying to find, when we have everything in Christ, quit trying to find it in this world to be set free, to be aliens and sojourners in this world. So let me pray for that. Father, I thank you for what we see in this passage. Lord, I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit. And I thank you that in the same manner, he's fighting for our hope in the midst of futility. He's praying for us when we can't figure things out and we don't know. God, if it was left to us figuring it out and always praying the right prayers, we'd all fall. And I just thank you that you've designed a spirit who intercedes on our behalf. God, let that encourage hearts this morning who are stumped and struggling and don't even know how to pray. God, let them know that their, their weakness is not the key, but your strength and your intercession will bring us through all these fiery trials. And so if we suffer, Christ Jesus, we will receive the inheritance with them. God, we long for that day when we will join you forever in glory to sing praises forever. God, thank you for this glorious gospel. Be with your children this morning, I pray. Amen.